Well, thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Mark, and thank you um, to everybody uh, who's made the effort to come here from uh, around our country or even across the pond to join us uh, today in this hopeful, optimistic, promising conversation about what the American Dream Accounts Act might do and what is being done in places around the country from San Francisco to states to cities to communities. I really do believe that if we're going to meaningfully address this fundamental challenge, the lack of access to higher education, which is both an economic issue, an opportunity issue, and in my view, a civil rights issue for the United States. If we're really going to address this in a meaningful way, we need the private sector, we need the public sector, we need the nonprofit sector, we need to all pull together to find reasonable, sustainable interventions that will make a lasting difference. And so, as Andrea said in the introduction, as someone who was both the son and grandson of classroom teachers and a parent myself, uh, you had me at hello in believing that education is one of the most important things we can be engaged in. Um, but I wanted to take a few minutes and share with you, if I could, just sort of what this experience was like at the Eye of a Dream Foundation and then how it informed my personal passion for this particular legislative idea. And I want to, if I might, just at the, at the outset, thank everybody who's been a part of bringing today together and who has labored so long in your own individual ways uh, to continue to make opportunity and education better and stronger for our country. To Mark, to Mark Edwards, to Opportunity Nation, thank you for what you're doing for your relentless focus on college access and affordability. Um, the 250 organizations that make up Opportunity Nation touch in different ways nearly 100 million people. And it was hugely encouraging to me to not just be part of your national summit, but to also uh, do a volunteerism day at Delaware State University in Dover and to see Mark both in settings grand and more practical and hands-on, and to see the scope and reach uh, of your vision and your ambition. Uh, and to Andrea, uh, and to everybody at the Corporation for Enterprise Development, which sounds really quite corporate, doesn't it? Um, thank you for what you do by bringing a data-driven analytical focus to the questions of how do we make smart investments that open better, broader doors for Americans and for hopefully folks around the world, because it is really my hope that by coming up with um, smart models and more inventive solutions that we might once again be a country to which other countries look for ideas about how to solve education and opportunity challenges rather than simply enduring a steady diminution of our global ranking as what we long enjoyed being a global leader in opportunity and today uh, a place that is diminished and where, as Mark said in his opening comments, there's countries all around us where the doors of opportunity are open and where folks are more likely to experience the American dream than here, the place that was in many ways the original author of it. Um, as has been said, your zip code really should not determine your future. So let me take uh, a minute, if I can, and just reintroduce you to some of what I experienced in 20 years with the I Have a Dream Foundation. I helped launch two different chapters. I worked for the national office. I served on the national board. And we touched about 15,000 um, children and families all across the country in more than 150 chapters, this foundation. And it was based on a very simple idea that a man named Gene Lang uh, really spontaneously um, followed, fell into when giving a commencement address at exactly the same middle school from which he had graduated in Harlem decades earlier. He was looking at a classroom full of kids and he was talking about his own life and how he had achieved remarkable things, to him unthinkable things from when he had sat in those exact same chairs. And it was really only because of a chance encounter when he was waiting tables that led to a college scholarship that made it possible for him to go to Swarthmore and then go on to be a very successful businessman and later philanthropist. And as he was talking to this group of young people and seeing sort of a lack of recognition of what he was even talking about, he realized that in those seats, in his own life, he never would have believed college to be possible. And so he made an individual promise to them that if Pell Grants or whatever other grants might be available from the state of New York or from the federal government aren't there for you, I personally, I will pay for your college education. Come meet me in my office. You'll get a letter from me. I'll get to know you and your families. It was an individual pledge to a specific group of kids. And I just want to say at the outset, it was that initial pledge that got the New York Times story and that was repeated often and is what most folks, if they know anything about I Have a Dream, know. There was this crazy guy who made a promise of a college education to a whole classroom full of kids in Harlem. But as someone who did that same thing myself and then was in the room over and over across the country as we launched other chapters, 
I know that that initial day and the response of parents and teachers in the community, while interesting, while engaging, while pressworthy at times, isn't what makes the difference. The 50 dreamers with whom my family and I worked in the east side of Wilmington um, grew up in a community and an environment where the possibility of college was really just not on their radar screen, where day in and day out, messages, subtle and unsubtle, convinced them that college was something that was on TV, something that was connected with sports, something that was distant and unreachable, even if only a few blocks away. That college was not for them. And the first step, I think, that is most important about these accounts and about the idea behind the I Have a Dream program is to change that perception, to have an answer to that question, how could I possibly make it to college? Well, we're going to open the door of the affordability question. But that means nothing if it's not also married to persistent, broad engagement and intervention. The kind of work that is often really only possible through real people connecting to kids, to parents, to teachers, mentors, volunteers, community folks. And that staffing that and driving that and making that real is what most local I Have a Dream chapters really do over a dozen years, is invest in the people who do the work of weaving together lives of educational excellence for children in contexts where that didn't seem otherwise possible. I've never forgotten a meeting at the Ford Foundation where they looked at our results and they looked at this program and they said, this is fascinating, this is great, this is neat. But all you're doing is helping a few thousand kids. How could this possibly scale to solve the problems of our nation? How could you address a whole school, a whole community, a whole city, a whole country? And if you can't do that, why this is just some novelty that'll have a few dozen instances. Deeply frustrated by that conversation, haunted by it. I worked for another year and a half for the national office, traveling around the country and going to announcements, and struck over and over by what happens. When you ask, and you all know this, when you ask a room full of elementary school kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you dream of? No one says, I want to die young. I want to contract HIV AIDS. I want to be homeless. I want to be a drug dealer. I want to be shot in gang violence. No one ever says that. It doesn't matter what community you're in, you hear the same answers in this country. I dream of success, I dream of being a doctor, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be an NBA star, I want to be a race car driver, I want to invent something big, I want to be Bill Gates. Every school I've ever been in, I get the same answers. As you said, the critical difference is the answers that our society and our country makes possible or impossible. And so if I might then, in a few more minutes, what I think is most exciting about the American Dream Accounts idea is that it deploys modern technology. It deploys essentially a Facebook account on steroids to make possible the scaling that was impossible 20 years ago. And in a day where partisanship so often narrows and divides here in Washington, I am deeply grateful that Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, someone who came to this Senate the same time I did, um, who is from a different political background, a different regional background, but who shares my passion for opening the doors of educational opportunity in this country, has joined me, not just as the co-sponsor last year, but as a co-sponsor this year as we reintroduce the American Dream Accounts Act today. This bill encourages sustained long-term partnerships between schools, colleges, nonprofits, businesses. It would allow them to create individualized student accounts that are secure, web-based, personal, and portable, and that contain information about each student's academic progress, performance, and preparedness, their financial literacy, their college awareness, and their future career path. And it would connect them to high-impact mentoring and to an individual college savings account. Instead of forcing a motivated parent or an interested teacher or a concerned student to track down each of these resources, which in some states, like Delaware, are available and exist, but are completely siloed. Instead of forcing a motivated teacher or parent to find these things across many different resources and connect them, it connects them from beginning to end of the educational journey. The American Dream Accounts Act addresses long-standing challenges and barriers to college access, connectivity, financial resources, early intervention, and portability. Let me briefly speak to each of these. Connectivity. One of the things I saw with the kids I worked with, we called them dreamers because it was the I have a dream program. 
from elementary school through high school through what had been hoped for college and in many cases was, but in many more not, was the impact of mobility. They all started in the same elementary school and by freshman year were in 14 different high schools scattered all over a broad area. And the simple transitions year in and year out that are accompanying poverty and the impact of that on any sort of relationship with classmates and with teachers and with mentors is a secondary but grindingly negative impact of poverty. So one of the things that this particular account would create is some connectivity. It would take advantage of technology and deliver these secure individualized hubs, a portfolio, an individualized dream record that allows a child to be known. Connecting that with a college savings opportunity, as Andrea said earlier, according to some studies, suggests that there are somewhere between a four and seven times greater likelihood of going to college. Because you've answered that first question. College isn't for me. How could I ever pay for it? Well, in a country where we literally spend billions of dollars federally to make higher education more affordable every year, why do we not tell children in a way that might change their attitude and their actions young? when the power not just of compounding interest but of compounding actions by them, their teachers, their mentors, their community, their parents could have a huge positive cumulative impact. As you're going to hear in a few minutes from Jose Cisneros, San Francisco's Kindergarten to College Initiative is really laying an exciting foundation in helping students and families save for college from the very first day of school. But as I said before from my I Have a Dream experience, it's not just the savings. It's the changed attitudes and outlook that makes such a profound difference. In my view, it's that third part, that early intervention, that is in some ways most exciting. Because way before they figure out that a FAFSA form is impenetrable, <laughs> way before their eyes glaze over in some college guidance counselor's office, way before they see the dizzying array of catalogs and wander out to do something more interesting to a teenager, you've set in the mind that UNLV isn't just a place with a great basketball team, it's a place you might want to go to college yourself. That Penn State isn't just a place that plays football, or Temple isn't just a place where they have a great basketball team. You don't just hear about college in one context, you think of it as a place you might go, and where you can see yourself. These accounts hold up a mirror to children that projects forward a brighter, more positive future picture of themselves. Last is portability. One of the things I saw most often about the kids I worked with was they moved and they moved into new classrooms where stressed out and overextended teachers dealing with 25, 30 kids really didn't get anything to work with. Virtually no information about the brand new student in their class in the middle of the year. No record of what they'd done in school, no sense of who they were or their context, no idea how to deal with them. And so young people themselves dealing with alienation from repeated movements from school to school to school, instead of having their full potential blossom, became a disciplinary problem, failed to achieve their full potential, failed to connect to that school, and so were even less engaged and less hopeful. The portability and the persistence of this information over the long educational journey is in my ways, I think, some of the most powerful things about it. Let me just say, if I could, um, in conclusion, that I am really grateful um, to Rachel Bird, who works um, with my office, I'm just the pretty face. She's the brains of the outfit who makes this whole thing work. And we're going to give Rachel a round of applause. You know, it has been um, her persistent hopefulness about this that has sustained my engagement and hard work on it. And I just, I am so grateful uh, for everything you've made possible here. Um, I am also really grateful to some good friends uh, from Delaware who are in the room, uh, to Jocelyn Stewart, um, who has truly believed in this, uh, to Clint Walker and to everybody uh, with Barclays, uh, to Andrew and everybody who has invested time and effort and hope and energy in this. It is really only through a complete partnership, schools, businesses, the federal government, the local government, families and communities, that solving this most nagging and fundamental problem of opportunity in our country is going to be possible. And so I cannot tell you what a gift this is. Um, to me personally, as someone who needs some encouragement every now and then, slogging through what is a 12-hour markup upstairs on the immigration bill. To all of us who serve in the Senate and need to see progress, and more than anything,
to classroom after classroom of students all over this country uh, from whom I retreated 25 years ago, 20 years ago, when I could no longer stand the pain of watching as elementary school kids having been told that they were the newest classes of dreamers. I couldn't face the reality, the factual reality, that even with that intervention, we couldn't get all of them over the line. We couldn't secure for them health care and housing, hope and educational opportunity. This could make the single biggest difference in contributing to educational opportunity, to meaningful hope for millions, millions of students across this country. That is truly exciting, and that is a gift worth opening together. Thank you.